Spotlight speech, Mr. Deepak Mishra, who is chair for Task Force 5 and director and chief executive, iCreer India, to address the audience. Hello and very good afternoon to all. It's always tough to start after a lunch. Um, but my name is Deepak Mishra. I'm the director and chief executive at ICREA, uh, economic think tank in Delhi, based uh, in India, based in Delhi. And many thanks to our G20 uh, core group for inviting me to speak at this session. The topic, as you see, I've been assigned is global financial order and macro stability. This is a combination of task force five and a task force one. Uh, I co-chair the task force five, but as you heard, the previous plenary session had a lot of discussion on multilateral reforms and global financial order, so I'm not going to repeat that. I'm going to focus more on the second part of this uh, presentation on macro stability. I'm not part of the task force one, but I have been an advisory, I have been a member of the advisory panel for the finance track. So what I'll try to bring is to have a horizontal breeze between the discussion that's happening in G20 and in the finance track with what we are going to discuss at T20. And as a context setter, my job is to obviously provide you lots of facts and data, whatever I can in this short period of time, and to hopefully provoke you to you know, answer some of the big questions that our speakers will be asked to answer for. So with that, let's get started. Um, I hope it's not too rude or uh, undiplomatic to say that India's presidency comes at a time of considerable external skepticism of G20. Um, I've just drawn three articles from Financial Times, Chatham House, and Think Global Health, where people have been constantly asking this question is, is G20 relevant? Does it matter? Is it uh, just a talking shop? Or are there actually real things happening? This is in deep contrast to the tremendous exuberance that you see at home, which I mean in India. You just heard the speech from India Sherpa with very tall and ambition expectation that India has set for its own presidency. And the best way to look at how exuberant the Indian policymakers and audience have been is to do a Google search. So if you do a search on the Google trends and saying how many Indians are talking about G20, um, that's a graph on the top, uh, we have already eclipsed any past G20 summit that has happened and we are just beginning. So, the next more popular, popular search G20 was the London summit, and, um, and that was at the height of the global financial crisis, and that was at the end of the summit. So you can imagine if you can build up this momentum, you're going to eclipse this graph uh, by many fold by the time the India summit starts. So just to give you a sense that there is a huge amount of expectations uh, and very positive uh, uh, collaboration that's happening in India to make sure that G20 remains a very relevant forum. There's also a lot of interest at the global uh, level too. Um, but why is this uh, deep skepticism abroad? Because of the fact that the global economy is in pretty terrible shape, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what those are and how the Task Force 1 and the Task Force 5 could help to shape that agenda. So if you look at this graph, it says global growth rate is at an all-time low, and the recessions have become more pronounced over time. The blue line is the global growth rate. The red line is the average, the episodic average for a certain period, and I have divided the G20 into four episodes. The first is the pre-G20, the world before G20. The second episode is the world that existed between uh, when the finance ministers used to head the G20, and then the heads of the state came in 2008, and the last episode is the COVID period. And you see today that the global growth rate is actually one of the lowest that the world has seen in the last 40 years. Um, at the same time, the emerging and the developing economies are being hit harder than the developed countries. So this is the average growth rate for those periods for the emerging market and developing countries. And you see that the growth slowdown in emerging market has been much steeper than what you see in advanced economies. So obviously everybody is suffering, but the growth slowdown is much steeper in the emerging market than in the rest of the world. At the same time, global trade has lost its momentum and there's very little appetite 
to return to the pre-globalization phase. So if you look at this uh, you know, chart over the last 40 years, and you talk about the first phase of the globalization, which Krugman and others call about hyper-globalization, 1980 to 2008, global growth rate uh, trade was growing gangbusters. So if you continue that trend till 2021, the global uh, trade would have been $64 trillion. And today it's $44 trillion. So there's a $20 trillion of missing global trade that has happened because the global trade has slowed, slowed down. And this obviously has a lot of economic consequences. Uh, at the same time, we see commodity prices have witnessed some of the fastest increase in recent memory. Uh, so today the fuel prices are four times higher than they were in 2016. The food and beverages are about two times higher than they were in 2016, and cereals are about 40% higher than they were in 2016. And we know this is a combination of a number of things, including the war in Europe, uh, you know, a loose and uh, accommodative monetary and fiscal policies, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the point is, uh, we know that the poor households have a larger proportion of commodity in their consumption basket, uh, so the poor household in every country is suffering more than the rich, and the poor countries are suffering more than the rich countries. So this is a tremendous importance for global needs. And then finally, global inflation is at the three-decade high and unlikely to return to the inflation targeting zone that many central bankers have. The blue line, again, is the actual inflation rate, and we know that in the 80s there was this massive inflation in Latin America, which basically takes the average global inflation to very high level. But if you look at the average over time, so 2020 was uh, the global inflation rate was 8.8%, and you have to go back all the way to 1997, when I guess many people would be in high schools or colleges, to get to an inflation rate of that level. So we are in a pretty unprecedented time when it comes to uh, things like growth, inflation, and other things. Sorry, this is... Um, so how, what have the countries done? Subject to slow growth, and a lot of these problems, many countries have taken unprecedented accommodative monetary and fiscal policies. And one way to see that is to look at what has happened to the investment rate. Many of them have been failed by public sector investment. And we have today, investment rates are all time high and growth rate is an all time low. So you can imagine what's happening to productivity and a lot of other things. So despite this massive infusion of capital through fiscal and monetary policy, the growth is not budging. But in consequence, you have a massive buildup in public sector debt. So you have the fastest increase in debt levels and to record high with several emerging market and developing economies in debt distress. So if you look at today, the, the advanced economies have a debt to GDP ratio close to 135%. The emerging and developing countries have about 60%, and both are record high. And the rate at which the debt has increased in emerging market is actually faster. Even if the level is low, the rate of increase is much faster, which means many emerging markets are in real uh, problems of either debt sustainability or you know, facing insolvency crisis or a liquidity crisis. So with that, you say, so what has G20 done over these periods of time when the world was going through this tremendous period of macro instability? Um, you could be optimistic and glass will say, yes, they've done some, or you could be a bit pessimistic and say, not much. But I'll give you one example. So we have a paper that uh, I and the co-author have done in ICREA, which looks at what was happening to trade-related commitments in G20. So this graph shows how many commitments the G20 communique had on trade, and if you see, the number of trade commitments have declined over time. So every summit talks about the number of commitments, and we track how many of them are trade-related, so that has declined. But those bars which show this horizontal line shows when, tra when trade shrinks, or the global trade falls dramatically, you have a bit of an increase in the number of trade commitments. So what has happened basically is when things go really bad, you, have, you are pushed to the wall, G20 does push and does some of the reforms, but when things go back to normal, G20 tends to ignore those issues. So there is no systematic effort to reform trade system. So I'll just have two minutes to finish my slides. So what can G20 do to revive growth rate and address the macroeconomic challenges? And these are the questions that 
uh, hopefully we're posing to our panelists who will come and speak about it. I think there's a lot that the G20 can do. It's one of the most powerful platform, as the Sherpa said, to deal with global issues. The first thing, um, and, and I deliberately want to be provocative, to say that is the G20 platform inadvertently resulting in excessive synchronization policies when business conditions across countries are not fully aligned? By this, what I mean is if you talk to Indian policymakers, they would say they were under tremendous pressure to stimulate uh, the economy after the COVID crisis and also after the global financial crisis. And the Indians were not keen to stimulate because they knew that you know, they don't have so much fiscal space. And also, they had different ideas to deal with the post-COVID crisis. And today, they look back and say, thank God, we did not succumb to those pressures and stimulate so much. And we have inflation, which is under control. So is G20 inadvertently pushing everybody to synchronize and push for a reform or changes which might not suit the country's context in that period? <clears throat> Should modern monetary policy account for, uh, for the global spillover effects? Uh, this is, you know, we all talk about exchange rate policies where you say, you know, you don't set exchange rate to bigger thy neighbor. So you don't want to, you know, depreciate your currency and then everybody depreciates and everybody is worse up. But monetary policy is exactly the same effect, but no central banker today takes into account the spillover effect of monetary policy in setting monetary conditions. Similarly, question you could ask is, is there scope for better coordination and transparency across national commodity price stabilization funds? Um, because uh, this is in reference to the commodity price stocks that you've seen. Similarly, on when it comes to debt and uh, common framework, is it time that we expand this to include middle income countries? Because uh, the low income country debt framework is not working, but once you bring in the middle income, there'll be more pressure to change and how do you bring countries like China and other into the Paris clubs to make real meaningful change on the debt reduction? Uh, finally, um, is the time for G20-wide safety nets like G20 swap line, something that is also being discussed in the task force one? Um, I'll just take a second to say that there is, uh, there's a whole lost, uh, lot of things on reforming MDBs. And we talked a lot about that in the first plenary, so I'm not going to repeat that. But in the task force five, we are looking at uh, four work streams. Out of which three are very important. One is how do you make MDBs lend more? Second is how do you make them leverage more, which is bring more private sector capital? And third is how do you make them lead better in terms of uh, the governance structures and others so that they're more accountable and more inclusive in their lending practices? Uh, so my time is up. I'll just end by saying that I'll end with a little bit of not so, not so pessimistic tone by saying that if you today search um, uh, on the web about G20, one of the most common article on G20 is G20 is dead, long live G20. And what do the authors mean by it? They say that you know, G20 might not be working very well, but this is the best platform that we have to reform the global economy and coordinate policies. So it is incumbent on us to make sure the G20 platform survives and thrives and succeeds in solving global problems. And I'm really hoping that our uh, speakers for this session will go over many of these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. That was very insightful. And with that, we transition into our next plenary on global financial order and macroeconomic stability. I will be inviting the speakers to the stage. Dennis J. Snower is founder and president Global Solutions Initiative Germany. Bambang P.S. Brodjonegro is professor, faculty of economics, University of Indonesia. Fukunari Kimura is Chief Economist at Area Japan. Vera Helena Thorstensen is Head Center for Global Trade and Investment Studies at FGV Brazil. Gulbin Sahin Beoglu is the Center Director, Economic Data Analysis Center, TEPAV, Turkey. And the Chair for this session is Jose Rizal Damuri, Executive Director, Center for Strategic and International Studies in Indonesia.
Okay, very good afternoon, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I hope uh, we have more energy, additional energy after uh, a, a very delicious lunch that we have uh, in order to talk more about the uh, global problems, the global economic problems that uh, uh, fortunately Do Dr. Misra already mentions, already explained to us. Um, it is, my name is Yoshe Rizal Damuri. Uh, it is really an honor for me uh, to chair uh, these sessions, the second sessions of the T T20 Inception Conference uh, uh, today. And uh, this session is titled Global Financial Order and Macroeconomic uh, Stability. I think uh, Dr. Uh, Deepak Misra has set the scene for our discussions. Uh, uh, he, he already provided the data and some analysis as well as also recommendations uh, about the, the current situations uh, uh, both uh, uh, at the global financials and macroeconomic stability. Um, so perhaps there are good starting points also for our discussions uh, this afternoon. Uh, and uh, to say the least, I think uh, everybody knows that uh, this is a very important topic uh, and very critical uh, since the world is still currently facing the uh, uncertainty, uh, high, very high risk that takes place after uh, uh, a long fight with the uh, uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, and the impact has been very imminent. Uh, the, the current, uh, the current uh, global economy is still, uh, is still very uncertain at the moment and high risk. The, the current geopolitical dynamics that take place uh, uh, recently also make the situations much, much worse. Uh, the, the combination between those two macroeconomic problems and the escalating geopolitical situations uh, has not only undermined the recovery agenda that we have, but it also already threatens the livelihood of billions of people in this planet. So we're not only talking about the macro economy at the, uh, at the uh, general level, at the absurd, uh, abstract level, but also already very impactful uh, to the livelihoods of the peoples. Um, G20 is of course expected to play a significant role to deal with the problems. Uh, but despite the successful events last year that we have in Bali, uh, there is still a lot of homework actually that we need to do. Uh, it needs to be done uh, in order uh, to deliver a meaningful outcomes. Um, so the main objective of this session is to discuss on how a G20 can come up uh, with a stronger commitments and also uh, meaningful actions. Uh, and uh, in these sessions, although um, the, 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 the title is Global uh, uh, Monetary and Financial Stability, but I take, uh, took liberty of uh, also including uh, the supply chain problems because we do have several experts here who is also very knowledgeable with the supply chain uh, uh, issues, uh, international trade issues, and also because of the, the topic uh, is uh, also re related um, uh, uh, or impact had very significant impact for the current situations. So um, I'm going to start our discussions actually uh, to uh, to ask questions uh, uh, to Dennis Nower from the Global Solution Initiative. Uh, uh, Dennis, by the way, has been very active in the T20 and G20 process, and uh, even last year, Dennis. Uh, also initiated and led the Think7 Germany to complement the G7 process. So, Dennis, uh, G20 is supposed uh, to provide platform for economic operations, but uh, we know that uh, greater cooperation is much easier uh, to say than done. So, um, what should member countries, uh, especially the, the G G20 member countries, especially the India's presidency also, uh, to do, uh, to bridge the diverse interests among the member countries, uh, and also to uh, fill the geopolitical gap. Uh, and what are the stakes uh, if G20 cannot come up with more meaningful cooperations? 
please. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the, this is a broad question, and I'd like to answer it in terms of three particular initiatives where I believe that the Indian G20 presidency has uh, unique opportunities. The first is well known in India, but not well known outside India, is that India is eons uh, uh, ahead of the rest of the world in terms of its conception of digital transformation. In the United States, large digital monopolies dominate our social and economic interactions. It's the first time in history where we do not form our own social networks. They're prefabricated uh, and the manipulation and security breaches and privacy breaches um, all arise out of a misalignment of interests between the digital service providers and data aggregators on the one hand and the users on the other. And India, through its India stack, this identification system and payment transfer technology, uh, it's um, Aadhaar, this national identification program, and particularly its data empowerment and protection architecture, DEPA, is far ahead of the rest of the world, and the world needs this. Uh, and what it needs most radically is a vision of um, where we are headed thereby. And where we're headed, I believe, is we're headed in a direction where we give control to the users of digital technologies. We empower them. We em give them control over their personal data, both individually, that they have to give informed consent, which is generally not the case um, outside India, and collectively, where we create data commons, where a well-defined group of people um, for well-defined purposes share data, and those who run this have a fiduciary responsibility that the data is only used for that purpose. And the way to move this forward is through exactly what India has focused on, which is unique digital identities. Uh, outside India, we have dozens of identities, Facebook, Google, they all put different identities. Um, and that uh, undermines democracy, it undermines truth, it um, gives rise to lots of manipulation. Therefore, I think it's really important um, for uh, this concept of giving users control, not only to be, to be something between individuals and the government, as it largely is currently in India, uh, or largely on financial services with the hope of uh, health services in the future, but covering everything. And this would be a great vision for the world. And just one last point, um, which is on your uh, d global supply chains. I think the world has made a big mistake uh, in basically uh, keeping old jobs, old uh, employment, old businesses alive during the pandemic, and therefore ossified uh, 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 a situation where the world is moving very rapidly. If India's G20 could be used to move away from standard fiscal and monetary policies towards what could be called adaptation policies, you provide financial incentives for those who are adapting to a new world. It used to be the pandemic, um, now it is uh, the global repercussions of the war in Ukraine. Uh, the world is changing very rapidly and we need incentives to match that change. And because people uh, are um, sticky in terms of their norms uh, and habits, uh, in that type of adaptation policy would ex be extremely useful. And the last point, and this is just a sentence I want to say is, the most important principle underlying all of this 
is the idea that we as a community of nations in the globe must meet together, must have a common identity at the level at which the problem arises. So if the problem is climate change, then it is humanity that must meet it. If the problem is water scarcity, then it's a regional problem. Um, and therefore, in dealing with the global problems that um, the G20 handles, we must come together not only intellectually, but also here in the heart in terms of our identities as um, a global whole. And I think the, um, my pronunciation is going to be um, okay. terrible, but um, the Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam is the central concept that the world ought to adopt. Um, and uh, if that can be brought across, a lot uh, has been achieved. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis, uh, for uh, uh, giving us uh, strong points uh, of India that, that India can offer in this uh, uh, presidency. Hopefully it would also help the, the G20 process. Uh, now let's go a little deeper to the international financial issues uh, by asking Pak Bambang Brojonegoro from University of Indonesia. Uh, uh, Pak Bambang actually held several cabinet positions uh, in the uh, uh, in the past uh, under the government of Republic Indonesia, uh, including also finance ministers. Uh, and last year, uh, uh, Pak Bambang led the T20, Think 20 uh, Indonesia as the lead co-chairs uh, of that Think 20. Uh, Pak Bambang, um, uh, we know like uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Misra also already uh, explained to us that one of the economic uh, the main features of the uh, pandemic is the expansions of fiscal and monetary policy, monetary uh, stimulus. And uh, the, the uh, uh, Indonesia uh, under the, the presidency last year actually uh, proposed some kind of uh, concerted efforts toward normalizations. But at, unfortunately, it did not kick off properly. So um, uh, what the G20 should do? Uh, at the moment uh, to reduce the consequences of uh, having uh, uh, erratic normalizations that we have uh, at, at the moment and perhaps uh, uh, what uh, India's presidency can come up with a better strategy uh, of exit strategy, better exit strategy. Uh, thank you, uh, Pa Yose. Uh, I believe uh, most of you have heard the latest announcement of U.S. inflation data. I think they announced uh, six point something percent. Of course, that was a good news. Good news is that the inflation has been in declining trend, meaning that the aggressiveness of the Fed to increase the rate might be moderated. And of course, it's good for emerging market to avoid the, you know, the pressure on the currency as well as the potential capital outflow. But the bad news, I think uh, Dr. Misa already uh, lined out uh, very clearly, is not yet on the target. I mean, it's still relatively too high for economy, advanced economy like US, meaning that we are not yet back to the normal condition. And that's basically what G20 is facing today. The uncertainty and the struggle after the recovery of the COVID. I think we must understand the big difference between the recovery after global financial crisis in 2008 and the recovery after COVID. Both on the, on the crisis, I mean COVID crisis as well as global financial crisis, of course started with the weak demand on the economy. But different reason, for different reason. In the global financial situation in 2008, the demand basically was lost. There is no power to do the demand because, you know, financial sector was in the big problem. In 2020, 2021, COVID crisis, financial sector was doing okay. The demand actually is there, but is severely restrained, severely constrained. So you, you like to make a demand but you cannot do that because so much restriction due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So as a result, when the recovery process coming by the easiness of the COVID-19 itself, in 2008, after the recovery, after the, the crisis itself, then uh, the Federal Reserve, for example, and other European Central Banks and other Central Bank had to do the monetary stimulus, the quantitative easing, to regenerate the demand. In COVID situation, that was not, that was not the case because the demand by itself exploded. I like to use the way exploded because that's what we, we can see everywhere in the world. Everybody is eager to do their economic activities. So the demand really exploding and somehow the supply side that has been silent during the COVID because, you know, they cannot supply anything due to the uh, week of, uh, due, due to the restrained demand cannot cope with the situation. So when G20 has to create concerted effort to deal with the current economic condition, of course, we are now concerned about the potential recession, potential slowing down of economic growth in 2023. But of course, we are not asking for either fiscal stimulus because it has been absorbed quite a lot during the COVID-19 pandemic, nor the monetary stimulus because it's not the prescription to deal with this kind of situation. So what should we do? I think this is the big homework for G20 members, start to deal not with the financial sector, but more on the real sector, on the production side, on the supply side of the economy. I remember when I was still part of the G20 as finance minister of Indonesia, most of the discussion in the finance track is about financial sector. It's about shadow banking, it's about uh, you know, uh, macro, I mean, financial stability and others. Not much discussion about the real sector. And I think this is the right time, especially after under the India presidency. Why don't we start thinking about how to deal with the supply side disruption after the pandemic? And in my opinion, there are two aspects of supply side disruption that needs to get attention in the G20 India presidency. The first is what Pa Jose already mentioned, the supply, uh, the supply chain disruption. I think it's very critical. I remember that there was a big scarcity of chips. And by scarcity of chips, of course, you cannot accelerate, for example, digital transformation because the essential element, which is chips, is very scarce. And of course, the price is a little bit high. So supply side or supply chain issue is a really big issue. The other issue would be on the workforce, limitation of the workforce after the pandemic. Of course, uh, this, this is more on the internal issue, but at least when you are looking at the production capacity of an economy, then you can see if the production capacity of an economy cannot fulfill let's say the, the domestic demand, then why don't we reform the global trade? The easiness of international trade, although we have WTO, but so far I think WTO has not yet uh, performed at the best in making the international trade as a solution, okay. you know, to, to deal with the supply side disruption. All right. So I guess that would be uh, my thought about what India presidency can do uh, during 2023. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pak Bambang, for reminding us the uh, two sides of the coin because uh, macro and finance cannot be uh, dealt separately uh, from the supply side. Uh, and we're going to continue later on uh, on the supply side issues, but now I would like to uh, uh, turn to uh, Gulbin Sayem Beyoglu. I hope you, I pronounce your name correctly. Very nice from mm -hmm. Economic Policy Research Foundation of Turkey. Um, and I would, uh, I would like to ask to you, Gublin, uh, uh, that uh, uh, another side of the 
monetary uh, or finance uh, or crisis, especially that happens, that is happening at the moment, uh, too many less developed and em emerging countries. Uh, uh, I'm talking about the debt distress, where the more than 60% of lab less developed countries uh, and emerging economies are in risk of uh, debt distress. Distrap. And a G20 uh, did not really come up with good solutions on how to deal with this uh, debt uh, situation. So how do uh, you think that uh, a G20 should do and what kind of uh, actions that maybe uh, uh, we need uh, at the moment? Thank you, Jose, and I also want to thank the T20 organization uh, and inviting me for being a part of uh, task force and uh, also for this panel discussion as well. Uh, so it's a very, uh, I'm very happy to be a part of T20 family actually. So uh, before going to the debt issues, I uh, want to refer Dr. Mishra's uh, nicely uh, putting together all the graphs uh, that highlights the severities of the current economic conditions. Maybe you have also uh, read the last report of World Bank, uh, Global Economic uh, Prospects. It predicts the uh, growth rate for this year as 1.7%. Uh, 1 1 it is the third week space of growth in the last three decades, and it reflects the um, continued monetary tightening, increasing, uh, worsening financial conditions, and uh, continued uh, supply chain problems and uh, access to key commodities. And um, the case is even uh, more vulnerable for, for the emerging developing economies, uh, as uh, Dr. Mishra's uh, graphs also highlighted the increasing uh, higher uh, increase uh, of uh, debt uh, levels of uh, emerging countries. So they are m more prone to uh, spillover effects of uh, advanced countries' policy impacts. For example, uh, we mentioned about today uh, the inflation numbers of US, and uh, I just read uh, Bloomberg News, uh, the Turkey version. Uh, the um, uh, incompatible statements of Fed's authorities uh, led to uh, market turmoil and I immediately checked the Turkish dollar rate. So that's what ha how we live in our country. So uh, this is have a, a huge uh, impact uh, in our countries. So uh, the monetary and fiscal policy coordination in advanced countries has utmost importance, especially nowadays. Uh, and uh, the fiscal policy uh, measures should not uh, extend, uh, add to uh, already high inflationary pressures triggering another round of interest rate hikes. Uh, in that sense, uh, fiscal uh, spending can be reprioritized and all the measures should be ensured to direct it to poor and vulnerable, for example, so that they can create some fiscal space. And of course, as we uh, witnessed today, for example, there is no room for politi uh, political uh, uncertainty in advanced countries. So they have to pursue a responsible communication uh, policy. Uh, they have to communicate well their policy steps and they have to be predictable and transparent. Uh, and. Um, uh, also, this uh, communication seems to be the key in every aspect. I mean, in the morning session, we also mentioned that the silo groups should not be silo anymore. We have to cooperate uh, uh, and communicate. So communication within the countries, within the policies, should be also within the, uh, within the central banks, for example. Um, uh, Mr. Chauver mentioned about um, uh, sharing information, sharing data, and sharing analysis also important. So in order to uh, monitor the risks better, we have to share. And it's uh, G20 nicely set up uh, monitoring principles, uh, 
uh, schemes like Data Gap Initiative, and it, is, it has been renewed uh, recently. But they, it has to go beyond that. We have to sh share analysis as well. And uh, central banks and G20 and the BIS have uh, roles in this. And um, uh, the coming to your very last, very specific question, yeah. uh, I think uh, for the uh, low-income uh, countries who are uh, facing very um, big debt stress threat, uh, there is common framework of G20, but it has to be renewed. And as uh, Mishra, uh, Dr. Mishra has mentioned, it has to be extended to middle-income co uh, countries. They are also waiting uh, a debt restructuring program. And it has to be transparent, so it can be improved by transparent methodological work. So the process has to be clear and it, uh, the, uh, it has to broaden uh, the creditor space and it has to uh, propose a, a fair um, uh, share burden, burden sharing. So these are my first round of remarks. Oh, thank, thank you, Jose. Thank you, thank you, uh, Gubin. Uh, now let's turn to the uh, global supply chain uh, issues. And uh, we have here uh, Fukunari Kimura uh, uh, from Economic Research Institute of, for ASEAN and East Asia. Um, and uh, Fuku uh, has been following uh, in details about uh, glo global supply chains for decades, actually. So what is your take uh, about what happens uh, during, during the last two years uh, in uh, global supply chain and global value chains? Uh, and how uh, we deal, we, uh, or G20 should deal with that, uh, especially from the risk of economic decoupling that uh, people already mentioned uh, on the global supply chain. Please. Uh, thank, thank you, Jose. Uh, yeah, I'm really closely watching uh, what's going on uh, with uh, the high, hiring uh, geopolitical tension and what's going on in uh, global value chains. Um, I, I think in this context, um, my conclusion for, my recommendation for uh, T20, G20 is very simple. Uh, we have a really old, simple, uh, but not obsolete uh, so message. Uh, you know that for economic development, we need trade and investment. We need vigorous economic activities. We need rule-based trading regime. We like to utilize uh, good aspects of globalization for economic development. I think this, somebody would think that uh, that's a really old notion. And, uh, everybody's talking about that too, much, too, too many, many times. But, but now uh, people in G7, particularly policymakers, forget that the importance of that kind of a really basic message. So I think a T20, G20 should teach uh, G G7 policymakers, and those are really, really important value, and we really need that. The context is like this. If you look at the newspapers and media, media uh, ca covering and, and other things in G7, uh, particularly I'm, I'm watching at, uh, Japan and the US, uh, so there are many, many articles talking about uh, the really serious things, the worsening uh, the confrontation between two uh, superpowers. It looks like uh, really going into a real, uh, uh, complete uh, Cold War pretty soon. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that kind of notion is very strong. Uh, the logic of uh, national security is very strong. We cannot, we, they do not have any sense of balance with uh, other things actually. So that's a really strong value. So we cannot really change that very strongly. Uh, but if you look at the uh, real world and look at the economy, uh, then what's going on is uh, quite, quite different actually. So uh, if you check uh, trade statistics in 2021, for example, uh, US-China uh, trade was the highest uh, in history, uh, both exports and imports. Same thing happens between Japan and the China too. And the Chinese economy is now slowing down uh, last year, so maybe uh, the figures are a little bit smaller, uh, but actually the value chains are still really moving. So what's going on in export control, import control, investment control, uh, I, I'm making a sort of a quantitative assessment uh, for the impact of those kind of uh, measures. And of course, uh, stop uh, the restriction of export, export to uh, Huawei, for example, that, that is a, a really effective, 
Uh, but uh, in aggregated level, those are very, very small. Uh, we cannot really see that. And also, uh, uh, the restriction of uh, uh, imports uh, coming from uh, the products, some, some part of uh, uh, Xinjiang Uyghur uh, products are mixed, uh, then they stop everything, actually. Uh, but actually, uh, still uh, many are uh, uh, imported in a sense and from China. And we cannot really detect uh, really 0.001% of Xinjiang Uyghur parts. So, so I think uh, still economy is moving, but that kind of things are not really in mass media, unbelievably. So really, uh, so really strong uh, worsening uh, uh, geopolitical tension issue is really political. And in G7, we have maybe Europe is a little bit in different contexts, but it's the US and Japan. Uh, we, have, we can see very sharp separation of political and geopolitical argument and economic reality. So, so I think it's now really important. Uh, uh, we have to see very carefully that now uh, uh, restrictions are getting uh, tougher now. Uh, so one is a semiconductor, so high end. Uh, they are trying to uh, use some sort of extraterritoriality uh, export uh, ban to uh, China, uh, that, that regardless of the production sites, for example, and also uh, uh, human rights issues, uh, that is going to be more strict, and also uh, so industrial policy to promote the domestic production of EVs in, in the US, for example. So, so we are having a little bit more restrictions, uh, but uh, there are many economic activities between uh, G7 and China too at the same time. So it's going to be a partial decoupling of supply chains, not total decoupling of supply chains. Right. So the rest of that economy, we really have to keep vigorous economic activities. Yeah. So I think the rule-based trading regime is now extremely important. Yeah. Uh, of course, many countries are having some uh, suspicious uh, policies uh, in, in a, a, a WTO or discipline. In a set of commercial policies, everybody is sinners, actually. Yeah. Uh, but we really have to keep uh, that sort of the total regime yeah. of uh, uh, guaranteeing a sort of uh, vigorous economic activities. Okay. Uh, that, so that's, that should be that sort of very important uh, message uh, by T20 and G20. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fuku. Uh, you mentioned several times about uh, 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 rules-based systems, uh, and uh, unfortunately, the WTO uh, is, is also in the crisis. Uh, and I would like to ask uh, Vera Tortensen from uh, FGV Vargas, who has very long experience with the WTO and multilateral trading systems. Uh, what do you? What is your take about the current uh, situation, uh, Vera? And whether uh, a G20 can also over concrete solutions uh, to the current uh, global uh, international trade problems uh, and the governance of it. Yeah. Thank you. So for, first, let me thank you, the, the, the organizer, for this invitation. And like, because I am an old professor, let me be quite frank with you, right? We are talking a lot about inflation, recession, crisis in energy, uh, the coupling of uh, 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 chains and so on. The, the point is, uh, why the G20 presents so poor results in dealing with the trade issue? Come on, how do you think G20, the rich countries, are going to, to allow developing countries to pay for the debt if they do not trade? So how to have a system without trade? And nobody's talking about trade. It's talking about uh, finance and macroeconomic stability and so on. The the, the question is why you have the two big powers, United States and China, destroying the system. That's the point. And how we can mend it. Uh, the, what, where the big problems are. The first is subsidiation. Uh, at the beginning, uh, everything starts with uh, uh, what is a market economy, right? And so China is not abided by the rules and is not a market economy. Tell me what's going on. The U.S. is giving one trillion dollars to the industry. Japan is 400 uh, 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 billions. Uh, the European Union, five, uh, 500 and something. Everybody is giving now money uh, and subsidies for environment reasons or digital reasons. But again, uh, how can we bring the system uh, to, the, to, to put some order on this? 
Uh, let's see that the, the subsidization in agriculture and goods is completely out of regulation. The second point is the digital world. What we have, the war of ships, and how do you think that the world is going to complain? Can you split the world as, as an orange into pieces? There's no way to decoupling the trading system. Sorry, this is impossibility. Now, uh, what we are seeing is this, not only the, the war of chips, but the war on regulation on digital world. You know, with all the, the, the discussion about privacy and so on, the European Union also uh, over-regulate in this area. The third area, area of concern is the environment. Look, there is no agreement relating trade and environment. And what we have, guess, we have notified to the WTO 14,000, again, 14,000 measures relating trade and environment. What's the meaning of this? It's that there is no rule, right? Uh, what are, where the, are the standards relating carbonization, decarbonization, everything else? There is, ISO is not doing this, the United States is not doing this, this is a fight between the United States and the European Union on, on, on this, the issue of standardization. And again, trade is suffering because of this. Again, are you going to split the world into pieces? The, the, the other important issue is service. Come on, 60% of trade is related to, tra to, to service. What's going on? Nothing. Nothing happens after the, the GATS uh, agreement was signed. Uh, and what we want to talk, uh, service is not a good that we can uh, 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 more or less to, to restrict with, uh, with tariffs. Uh, service about domestic regulation. Go to domestic regulation on service. With one taxation, you can kill a service. So uh, what you need to do is exactly to focus on this, uh, the main areas. And uh, the, the last one is dispute settlement. Again, uh, what's happened? The United States became uh, you know, jealous because of the, all the whole issue and kept the ball out of the game, to remember the Qatar game. And uh, what's going on? Because there's a fight between the United States and the uh, European Union to have arbitration, that is one case by, by time and that's all, or to transform the WTO in the tribunal of trade and so on. Two different models, impossible, United States again, the European Union. So the question is, uh, what's the role? The, the only question I have, mm -hmm. what is the role of G20 on this? We are going to stay with all empty uh, declarations of ministers and so on, and nothing happened. And more than this, what is the role of emerging countries inside the G20? You are half and half. So we are going to be silent again. Nothing again will happen because you cannot agree. So this minimum denominators is a terrible killing for, for the trade system. Okay. I will finish this. What we are doing here is to have a say as developing countries what we want for the new trade system. And please, G20, do something. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Vera. Uh, I think that's a very a strong note. Uh, and also, hopefully, the G20 uh, president, uh, India G20 presidency can also take up uh, that kind of uh, recommendations and bring concrete measures uh, toward the uh, government governance of trade, international trade, and global supply chains. Uh, since we don't have much time, I would like uh, uh, to open up the floor uh, uh, to the audience uh, uh, for for asking questions to our panelists, but I don't know whether uh, 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 some of you uh, have some kind of comments or uh, inputs to what other or, uh, others remark? No? So maybe... <laughs> okay. So maybe we can, we can uh, uh, invite the audience uh, for questions. Is, are there any questions? You, sir, in the back. Uh, I would like to collect uh, three questions first. Yeah, my name is Gopinath. I'm from E-Notice International. Uh, can, can you, you speak me? up? Uh, my, my name is Gopinath. I'm from E-Notice International. I would like to ask one uh, question to the panel members about the elephant in the room. It's about trust in, in the system. Uh, we had, without trust, 
something like cri cryptocurrency coming up and collapsing. Do you see in the next one and a half, two years, any other systems coming up uh, so that people don't have, really don't have trust in the system we have at the moment? To whom are you going to uh, address the questions? The red, red tie. Sorry. I, I don't remember your name. Oh, the, Dennis. Yes. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, we, maybe we can collect uh, first, Dennis. We collect three questions. Any other questions from the audience? This is really, uh, okay. I think, thank you very much. This was an incredibly informative and inspiring panel. Um, I do have a couple of questions. The first one is on the WTO and the future of world trade. And I wanted to ask you um, about your opinion on the plurilateral initiatives and um, how to make them a little bit more um, attractive um, to those who are more skeptical towards uh, these initiatives. And the second one is uh, to Dennis on um, the future of digitalization um, and uh, apart from the many, many um, benefits, um, it also creates new vulnerabilities and new threats. And I wanted to ask you what the G20 can do um, about this with regard to cyber threats, but also with regard to the big, big, huge issue of disinformation um, and narratives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stormy. Uh, and, uh, this gentleman. Good afternoon. Uh, There's a very excellent discussion which happened. And, uh, Louder. Uh, I must compliment all of you for an excellent discussion. The points which have been raised uh, sharp. Can you speak up a little bit louder? I, okay. Yeah. I'll put the work. Yeah. Okay. No, my, anyway, is that better? Yeah. Right. My name is Pradeep Mehta. I head a think tank called International NGO called CUTS. Uh, my question to the panel is, uh, is there any discussion on any new form of financial <coughs> arrangement, something like a Tobin tax or Robin Hood tax, in order to particularly deal with the climate uh, uh, finance uh, needs, which, as you know, has, if you look at the history of commitments made by the developed world, ever since June 192 Earth Summit, those promises have never been kept, and therefore, uh, don't we need a kind of a neutral international fund in order to deal with this? Thank you. Okay. This is to the whole panel. All right. Okay. So, uh, so who's going to start? Oh, I will be with the Chris? first. Yeah. Thank you very much for the, the, the question. It's, it's perfect. Look, how to solve the issue of trade uh, blockage? Certainly true plurilaterals, but more than plurilaterals, that is only a part of members that can agree and the others will uh, follow when they want to. More than this, what I might suggest is to transform the treaties, the, you know, the rule of lawyers, they get a lot of money in defending panels, to guidelines. The world is so complicated now in our days that it is impossible to get a treaty on anything you want. Forget about this. Plurilateral is a good proposal, but still this is not, uh, is not going to work because of the, the fragmentation of the word interest. So the, the point is go to guidelines. Uh, the, the ones that want to follow, go ahead and the secretariat, put some power on the secretary of the WTO, that this, this uh, member-driven organization, it's a killing, it's awful. You have to have a, a secretariat-driven organization to put uh, pressure on this. And then to give them uh, any kind of, a kind of instrument to follow what the countries are doing, like some kind of metrics like the OECD is doing, we can develop this to country. And certainly this is a point that is the way, the way uh, to get out of the, the mess, right? And just a, a little point, we talk about, about Brazil deforestation that they are destroying on the forest. Again, it's true, this is the production side. Why the W cannot work on dealing with the demand? Why rich cultures are buying rare wo uh, woods? Why they are putting these woods where? So wh why you cannot also go to the other side, the demand the and the offer of the case of the, the case of woods, the case of deforestation and so on. 
and again, the carbon tax and all this, how to get uh, WHO involved to solve the issue. Okay. Dennis, you have two questions, at least, for, for you? Very quickly. Um, the question of trust is absolutely essential because without trust, both societies and economies fall apart. I think one extremely important initiative to help restore trust would be to ta use this G20 to measure determinants of trust. And I believe there are, if four value-driven determinants um, of uh, trust and well-being that uh, can be measured. In fact, we have measured them time series for over 160 countries. Um, one is obviously GDP that is already being measured and its distribution. Another is solidarity, the degree to which there's social cohesion, you're embedded in your communities. Uh, a third is agency, the degree to which you're empowered to shape your life through your own efforts. It's another basic human need. Um, and a fourth is environmental sustainability. And if you put that together, um, solidarity, agency, goods, environment, you get SAGE, which is a form of wisdom. And all these four elements can be measured. They all have normative force and help align countries. And if you have a country where people can feed themselves and their material needs are met, they are empowered to shape their lives and they are well nested within their communities and they're not killing the natural world, that is a place where trust can grow. And these countries are doing well. The G20 should measure this and since India has this far more inclusive understanding of well-being, why not make this the G20 where uh, solidarity, agency, environmental sustainability are measured alongside GDP from year to year? Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dennis. I, uh, I believe we come to the end of our session, so not much uh, time left. But before I close the sessions, I would like uh, to ask uh, all of you uh, to uh, briefly make a remarks about uh, the, the, the current situations that, that the world is facing and then how basically uh, Think20 or Think Tank Network like Think20 uh, can support, can contribute uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the process. Uh, especially G20 process and how to make it more effective so that uh, uh, perhaps uh, the Think20 India could also uh, uh, learn from uh, uh, that input. Uh, I start from uh, Pak Bambang, uh, you're the uh, lead co-chair of Think20 Indonesia from your experience last year. Yeah, I believe the T20 community should keep reminding and guiding the government which is G20, to prioritize still the recovery after the COVID. Because as we discussed before, recovery is not yet there. I mean, it's still an uh, ongoing process. While we are focusing on the recovery, we keep to remind them that the recovery should be directed toward new direction. And those new directions are sustainability and digital transformation. Thank you, Baba. And you, Dennis, perhaps from your experience last year in Think7? I think the T20 has a special responsibility to advise the G20 to address global problems globally rather than nationally. Um, climate issues, digital issues are often addressed through national teams in competition with one another. The T20 has an opportunity to build bridges and bond uh, and thereby create a better understanding of the aggregate whole. Fuku uh, Kimura? Yeah, I, th I think now, uh, the, uh, as I said, the policy discussion in the G7 is a, a really uh, one-sided in a sense. Uh, we have to have some balanced view. Uh, we need economy. We need uh, really uh, 
uh, active uh, trade and investment, particularly for economic development. I think uh, G20, T20 should provide that kind of message to uh, G7. Uh, that's a very important role for that. Okay, Gurmin, yeah, do you have suggestions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, in the first session, Mr. Uh, Professor Sonobe nicely put uh, the responsibility of T20 and the importance of T20. I worked long years for the central bank, so I was on the kind of G20. So I had the limitations of thinking because it's more implementation. But here we don't have any limits in, T, in the T20 group. So it's a very nice bridge from academia uh, and uh, the partners, uh, the sector uh, people. So uh, it's the uh, innovation fora. Uh, so it's the brain in a way. So we have the uh, distinguished group who can uh, innovate. So uh, that's, uh, that's just free thinking is, is our job, I think, to contribute without limitations. Thank you. Thank you. Fera? Again. Uh, think tanks are to think and speak louder. We are not to have to be diplomatic <laughs> again. Right. And the message is the coupling trade is nonsense. Developing countries cannot pay debts and pay what, uh, buy things without trade. So that's the message. Okay, thank you. Thank you all uh, to all the five speakers. I think this is, has been very insightful sessions. Uh, um, uh, we have discussed challenges and opportunities of uh, the G20 process uh, and also on how to deal with the macroeconomic uh, and finance stability. I will not, not try to summarize the discussions because uh, it would not do justice. There are many things, uh, there are many important uh, issues that have been discussed. So, um, uh, but uh, let's uh, agree that we still need uh, G20. And uh, it's our task to make the process more meaningful and uh, deliver concrete uh, uh, actions. Uh, and to, officials, to officially end our discussions, I would like to uh, uh, invite you all to join me to give uh, uh, appreciations to all our uh, speakers uh, that already give us very insightful and meaningful discussion. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you to our speakers for a very engaging session. I'd now like to invite Dr. Nilanjan Ghosh, who is the director for the Think 20 Secretariat, to introduce our next spotlight speaker, Mr. Jayan Sinha. Dignitaries, uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce uh, our spotlight speaker of the session, Mr. Jayan Sinha. Uh, Mr. Sinha, a member of Parliament India, is uh, the chair of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Finance. He has held uh, portfolios like Minister of State for Finance and Minister of State for Civil Aviation in the Government of India. He had been a member of the Public Accounts Committee for 2019-20. And uh, in his previous avatar, uh, uh, prior to being a politician, he has all been an investment fund manager and a management consultant. His interests and proclivities in environment and climate change have been evident from uh, his various uh, recent initiatives and writings on green transition and on overall climate action. So with that, uh, sir, it's over to you. I welcome you to take over the dais. Thank you very much, uh, Nilanjan, and a very good afternoon to all the dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and members of the media who are present here. We got a very good segue into all the issues related with uh, climate change and climate finance uh, from our G20 Sherpa, Sri Amitabh Kanji. And in particular, 
what Shri Kant uh, suggested and uh, highlighted is that today we are dealing with not just one, but many, many crises. So this is an age of polycrisis, uh, as many people have suggested and proposed. So this is an age of many different crises. And in this age, for us to get support for accelerated action on climate is actually very, very difficult. And that's why I thought it would be very opportune to actually play for you this scene from this movie, which many of you might have seen. So let me just play the scene. Uh, Ritika, can you just cue that? I just have to press the cue button. OK, here we go. There's a comet headed directly towards Earth. Do you know how many the world is ending meetings we've had over the last two years? Drought, oh. famine. Oh, and the ozone is so boring. So I just thought this was a very good scene to start uh, you know, discussions on climate action, because what you see from this uh, movie called Don't Look Up is that the world is jaded. The world is jaded. We are living in an age of polycrisis. Everything seems to be a crisis. We have a food crisis. We have an energy crisis. We have a climate crisis. We have a global trade order is fracturing crisis. Do we really have the time and the attention in this world of crises to focus on climate action? Ladies and gentlemen, I will argue that we have no choice. We have no choice. We cannot be in a situation where everybody is looking down on their smartphones and trying to browse the web and get their Instagram feed and their Facebook feed. We've got to look up and we've got to look at this presentation as well. Because climate action, climate action really incorporates and really embodies so many of these different crises we are facing, whether it's energy, whether it's food, whether it is what's happening geopolitically. And so it's very, very important, I think, particularly for the G20 and exactly as Srikant said, for all of you who are the brain trust for the G20 to really engage with this set of issues associated with climate and to start to guide us as policymakers on what you think is the right way to move forward on climate action. And with that, I just want to introduce you all to a set of ideas that we've been working on, uh, which is around the Global Climate Alliance for Accelerated Climate Action. We've been very fortunate and privileged to have many members of the G20 uh, through their various different research institutes and think tanks uh, working on this and collaborating on this. Uh, we've been fortunate to have folks from MIT, from Tufts, from the London School of Economics, from DIW, from ORF, uh, from WRI, the World Resources Institute, many, many uh, folks, Brookings, uh, all of these collaborating to put together this set of ideas. And that's what we want to present to you. I'll go through a few slides just to highlight what these ideas are about. And then we will have for you uh, the actual book that we put together on this set of ideas, which we will be launching as soon as I finish. But let me just show you a few slides to highlight what we mean by a global climate alliance for accelerated climate action. So the first thing I want to emphasize is that net zero is net positive. We are going to go through this in much more detail uh, through some of the roundtable discussions we've already had, we will continue to have in the T20. There's much more detail on this in the book that we will be releasing. But folks, net zero is net positive. It's a win for the planet, obviously, as we decarbonize. But it's a win for the global south and a win for the global north. If we can get off the global warming trajectory that we are on right now, which according to the UNEP is going to take us to 2.8 degrees centigrade of global warming by 2100. So if we have a chance of getting to 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade, we have to take action. And if we take action, it's a win-win-win. Now, to achieve that, particularly for the global south, because most of the global north is already legally committed to net zero. The EU, of course, has fit for 55. The UK, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, all have passed laws committing them to net zero by 2050. Japan has done the same thing. We have to invest massively to make it happen. What the analyses are telling us is that in India, for example, when the private sector is investing $65 billion a year, for us to get on a decarbonization pathway that gets us to net zero by 2070, 
we have to double private sector capex we have to increase private sector capex by 50 to 100 billion dollars to be on a decarbonization pathway that's what india requires it's exactly similar for brazil for indonesia for nigeria south africa and for other global south countries now if we have to double private sector capex in india to be on a net zero pathway we need a lot of help and support from the multilateral development banks from the development finance institutions from the global north sadly leave aside the hundred billion dollars that she can't spoke about earlier today what we are seeing the mdbs do is to actually fail in this very very important priority if not the most important priority for them and the numbers right now self-reported these are the numbers coming from their own reporting on climate finance you can see do not get anywhere close to the trillions of dollars that are required for the global south for decarbonization one of our colleagues uh, Sri Amar Bhattacharya ji has run the numbers on this and his estimates are that the global south requires two to two and a half trillion dollars a year for mitigation just to get to net zero I'm not even talking about adaptation and resilience just for mitigation requires two to two and a half trillion dollars a year this is the global south ex China not including China so the scale of the requirement for climate finance is extraordinary and unfortunately the global financial system and there's plenty of capital in the global financial system particularly in the global north is not able to bridge the gap between the capital that's available in the global north and the financing requirements in the global south and there are a number of gaps here risks such as currency risks such as policy risks that mean that the cost of capital for a steel company in Brazil for a renewables company in India the cost of capital is punitively high particularly when we look at equity cost of capital and therefore we are not able to close the gap and we are not able to get the trillions of dollars that are required for the global south to move for climate financing so what we are proposing is a global climate alliance I'm not going to go into details on this slide because this is all laid out in the book in some detail but what we are suggesting is that we build on the Paris Agreement that we have two groups of countries a group a which need not necessarily sign up for net zero by 2050 but then there is a group B and this group B is largely the OECD countries many of which have already signed up for net zero by 2050 there may be some global south countries that will be in group B as well but in general the group B countries have to support the group A countries in decarbonization there will have to be financing and technology flays, flows so that the group A countries countries like for example India can actually get on the net zero pathway otherwise it's not going to happen and what that really means what that really means is that we have to transform the climate financing system that we have to plug the gaps that I spoke about earlier we need to have the MDBs and the DFIs really playing a vital role in doing so for dealing with the risks that are there when you invest in the global south we need green investment agencies in the global south we need alignment of standards we need alignment of policies and we need sufficient financing from the global north to pull this off otherwise the trillions of dollars are not going to flow and this uh, whole decarbonization net zero pathway cannot be achieved by the global south so we are talking about a variety of different blended capital instruments that collectively can unlock the trillions of dollars of capital flows that are required and I want to emphasize that the trillions of dollars are not going to come from global north budgets they cannot no one is expecting that they have to come from the private sector but there is a very important role for public sector capital here and that is to create the blended finance instruments that can unlock these private sector flows as well as to provide support for some important grant based programs such as for loss and damage and for the JETP programs that are underway so there is a portfolio of blended finance instruments that need to be unlocked and once we unlock them then we can make this happen so the practical way of moving forward on this is through a sector by sector approach we have to take various different sectors whether it's steel 
whether it's cement, whether it's energy, whether it's the financial system, we have to put it into the G20 process and work it through sector by sector to make this happen. The best way to implement this is through working groups in these different sectors, which is what we are proposing happens through the B20 process. And so I'll conclude, I'll conclude by another scene from a movie. Another scene from a movie. And some of you may recognize this, but it really articulates, ladies and gentlemen, it really articulates what the global south is asking the global north. So let me play the scene. Show me the Show you the money. Oh, no, no, you can do better than that, Jerry. I want you to say it what you would mean it, brother. Hey, I got Bob Sugar on the other line. I better hear you say it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Show you the money. Not, not show you. Show me the money. Show me the money. Yeah. Louder. Show me the money. That's it, brother, but you got to yell that shit. Show me the money. I need to feel you, Jerry. Show me the money. Jerry, you better yell. Show me the money. So, to just end, end on a, on a, half, half uh, joking mode. The fact is that it is about show me the money. It is about show me the money. What the UN modeling is showing us is that if you move forward over the next few decades, the vast majority of global emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, 70% or more are going to come from the global south because the global north is already committed to net zero and they have the capital and the technology to get there. Japan will get there, the UK will get there, the EU will get there. But it is India and Nigeria and Bangladesh and Brazil and Indonesia. It will be very difficult for us to unlock the financing, to unlock the technology, to be able to get there without the support of the global north. And so I'll once again end as a fervent plea from the global south, show us the money. That's how we can make it happen. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And now I would request all the members that have worked on putting together this uh, book to just come up with me. We'll release and launch this book and, uh, of course, give it to all of you as well. Thank you so much. Could my colleagues please come up? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sinha. You really did make a very impassioned case for climate finance. We will now take a short break, uh, and we request you to assemble at 3.10 back in this room for the next plenary. Tea and coffee is outside.